Hello, spyhards, diehards. Cam the Provocateur here. I'm currently lost in Europe on vacation, and so our regular programming is not really unfolding as it usually does. So in the meantime, we are going to give you an exclusive preview for one of our Agents in the Field episodes, which are available if you'd like to hear more of them on our Patreon account. We'll have links to that in the show notes below. We are going to give you a preview of 1971's Dirty Harry. And if you enjoy this episode, there are more Dirty Harry episodes behind the paywall. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And we will be back next week with a normal episode reviewing the 1956 Civil War spy caper film, The Great Locomotive Chase, produced by Walt Disney Studios and starring Fess Parker. So we hope this episode makes your day, and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome back to Spy Hard's podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Scott, you can just get yourself another delivery boy. Well, we've got some uh, dirty jobs to do this week, Cam. Dirty deeds done dirt cheap because we are going to talk about 1971's Dirty Harry. There is no ACDC connection to this movie, but I just felt like working that in some way. You did. It landed. It's all good. Um, I've been looking forward to watching this film for quite some time since we tackled Firefox on the show about a year or so ago now. Like, it's always, people have been like, you've got to check out the Dirty Harry films. And we had, you know, uh, Wendell Wellman, who wrote Firefox, which starred Clint Eastwood, and he would also appear in the fourth uh, Dirty Harry film, Sudden Impact. Yeah, that's right. And also, I think, I feel like even on Twitter and what have you, when we did Where Eagles Dare, people were bringing up Dirty Harry to you. Yeah, probably because I hadn't. I must have mentioned it then as well that I hadn't seen any of his films. Um, so I, it's been a long time coming, and we're finally here. I finally got my forty-four Magnum in hand, and I'm ready to solve some crime. <laughs> solve crime, I guess. Uh, well, <laughs> shoot crime. I don't know. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's that's San Francisco for you, maybe. I don't know. Uh, well, not not really. <laughs> no. Fair enough. Not really. <laughs> okay. Sorry, San Franciscan San Franciscans. Sure. Yeah, those guys. Um, well, for those who haven't seen Dirty Harry, here is your letterbox.com synopsis. Oh, Lord. All right. Fine. This is a long one. You'll be checking how many uh, bullets you have left in the chamber by the end of this. Dirty Harry. Detective Harry Callahan. He doesn't break murder cases. He smashes them. <laughs> I like that. That's great. Mm. When a madman, dubbed Scorpio, terrorizes San Francisco, hard-nosed cop Harry Callahan, famous for his take-no-prisoners attitude to law enforcement, is tasked with hunting down the psychopath. Harry eventually collars Scorpio in the process of rescuing a kidnapped victim, only to see him walk on technicalities. Now the maverick detective is determined to nail the maniac himself. It's so weird, because this is a pretty stripped-down, straightforward movie. Mm. I, I don't know why they felt they needed uh, that many sentences. Very strange. Also, it kind of, like, removes all the tension of the first two acts of the film, because you know yeah. that he gets arrested. Yeah. Weird. That's a weird choice. Maybe it was written by Scorpio himself. He mostly shouts, to be fair. That's true, he it'd does. Be, and squeals. It'd all, yeah, it'd be all caps. Um, but yeah, like I, this is an Agents in the Field episode, obviously exclusive for you lovely patrons out there, so we won't get into the background of the film, but let's just talk about sort of maybe a little bit about our experiences with the film in the past. Like I'd never seen any of these. I'd been excited to do so, but Cam, I, I think you had definitely seen these films. Yeah, so when I was a teenager, a late teenager, I watched all the Dirty Harrys. I was a big fan at that point in time of the Lethal Weapon franchise, the Die Hard movies. And so I think I went into Dirty Harry expecting the wrong thing. Because, like, this is clearly not something akin to 80s action like Lethal Weapon or Die Hard. And I remember watching it and being like, okay. 
okay. And I knew just in pop culture of the whole, you know, make my day is a saying that would come into play in the fourth film. But the whole, do you feel lucky punk stuff in this movie? I knew that just from the pop culture world. So I really did think they would be more, I think, action-based cop, you know, thrillers. Sure. And I was kind of thrown, I remember, by this one. I watched the whole series. And um, I would say I mostly enjoyed them all. But it wasn't until maybe like two or three years ago that I went back and revisited this first Dirty Harry and was much more impressed with the kind of the layers to that film. Um, It's very problematic in a lot of ways, but in ways that are interesting. Like there's movies that I think are just kind of gross to watch. There's Then there's others that you really get to examine the place and time in which it was coming and what was going on in the water. And I think Dirty Harry is a fascinating example of this made by a great filmmaker. So... Yeah, I kind of came around on Dirty Harry. Not that I disliked it the first time, just that I went in with, I think, um, the wrong assumptions about what it would be. I never really got the impression it was particularly problematic. I know there's some stuff in the film, some of the things it, it deals with maybe is problematic, but I don't think it's like, you know, one of our dinosaurs is missing problematic. Not, well, I, I think more in terms of the fetishization of firearms, the sure. uh, glorification of vigilante justice. There's a lot of like oddball things that were very much in the water in 1970s film. So it's kind of just cinema though, isn't it, Cam? Like the glorification of guns you still see in films now. That uh, I mean, it's That's still true. There. And, uh, you know, vigilante justice. The Batman came out th- four months ago and people, you know, flocked to see that. Yeah, no, you're dead on right, but like this movie, even at the time, was very controversial. There was a lot of critics referring to it as fascist filmmaking. It was a movie that carried a lot of baggage for, I think, even today. You know, you look up reviews, I was just looking up on Letterboxd, and people were referring to it as like morally repugnant, um, using terms like that, you know, but still liking the movie, acknowledging kind of the masterful filmmaking on display and how interesting the movie is, but saying like, morally, this movie's really, really problematic. I suppose maybe in like what it's dealing with is problematic. It's like um, Taxi Driver. Yeah, that's that's not a problematic film, but it's right. the things it's tackling are potentially. Um, well, I'll use problematic again, but I don't know if that's the right word. But yeah, you know, there's something. It's, it's there's meat on the bone to discuss, to chew mm-hmm, on, definitely, as it were. Um, well, I guess I'll jump in with my thoughts then, because you already had sort of a background in it, and maybe you can. Tell me what you think about it now. After that, I was surprisingly swept up in this one. Mm-hmm. I I thought it would leave me cold because I don't really like cop dramas. I don't like the glorification of guns and all that sort of stuff you just mentioned, really. I like vigilante justice when it comes to like superhero films, but that's superhero right. films. It's it's meant to be hyper reality. But there was like just from the get go, you've got like I think it's Le- Lalo Schifrin did the the score to this, and it like hits you immediately, and you are so great. It's so, so great. great. I've listened to it since on my own, like just out when I I think I was, I was in the gym training, and I was just like, I'm gonna put this on. It's not really a training album, but it just it was great. Um, and you, immediately you're just transported into this world of San Francisco in the mid '70s, and you feel the grime and the grit. And I completely buy Harry Callahan as a character. He has completely sold me instantaneously on this character. And so f- from that point on, I'm just being taken through the film as he chases down Scorpio. And then I find out all these really cool things about the film that you know, the villain is played by Andrew Robinson. I didn't know that going into it. I'd only known Andrew Robinson as Garrick in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Yeah. So it was nice to see him as a young man and still as bonkers back then as he was in, you know, in the mid-90s. Um, and and even, like, you, you got, like, Poppy from Seinfeld is here. I, was, I didn't expect that either. Uh, all these little things were cropping up that would, like, get a smile out of me. But at the same time, there's this really dark, gritty story in this. And I can just... I completely get if someone's like, said some of these, like, noir stories of the last 30 years were referencing back to this. Because I feel like this was maybe a bit of a watershed moment when it came to this sort of storytelling. Yeah, it definitely was. Like, this movie was a huge hit. Yeah. Um, Massive hit. I I, I have a feeling it would be, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And revisiting it last night, it just sucks you in. 
Mm-hmm. And it's such like a simple movie of just there is a serial killer out there. His motives are we don't really know what his motives are. Um, and it's just this rigid, you know, lawman who has really no respect for the system, the way the system operates, and mm-hmm. kind of operates as this one man deliverer of justice. Um, and to me, like it's Clint Eastwood understanding the iconography of himself as a performer. You know, we had just a few years before this, you've got the uh, Man With No Name trilogy, the, you know, Western classics by Sergio Leone. So, like, Eastwood knows how to use his presence, and it's him applying that here. And there's so many moments where it's just Dirty Harry standing still, and you're like, holy crap. I think of a shot near the end when he, um, when Scorpio's on the school bus, and you just see Harry standing on the overpass from a distance, and you're like, wow, that is fantastic. And Don Siegel is like... In the realms of sort of filmmakers of this era, Don Siegel isn't one you're going to hear named at the top, but he was very much the mentor to uh, to Clint Eastwood as a director himself. He always said Don Siegel is the one who taught him everything he knew. And even in this movie, there's a little nod to Eastwood's own directorial career. There's a movie theater that's playing Play Misty for Me, which was a Clint Eastwood directed film. I think it was his first film, actually. And you see it a couple times in this movie. Um but, like, Don Siegel knows how to create this very, like, tense, involving, you know, cop sort of procedural. It, yeah. The procedural it's, it's elements are a little... It's in there. Yeah, it's in there. Um, But it's very much like a cat and mouse movie. Mm-hmm. And I kept thinking throughout, when they were doing all the press for The Dark Knight, Christopher Nolan, over and over, ago, uh, over, and over again, cited um, Heat as his primary influence. And there was a few others. I never heard him mention... Dirty Harry. And I was watching it last night going like, my God, there's a lot of similarities here. You have, as you said, like the vigilante element of the guy who's crossing the line. Because Batman does cross the line in the Dark Knight, and it's very much pointed out by other characters. And you also have this villain who is... He doesn't seem to belong to a normal world. Like, the Scorpio in this movie is very much this agent of chaos. There's... We don't know anything really about him. He's basically homeless, it seems... You know, he lives at a stadium um, and is just killing people just because he likes it. And yeah. the movie is frequently positioning these two against each other. And you can see that, like, Dirty Harry has issues. That it's not this, like, you know, pure white versus pure black. Like, there's weird shades of gray in the Dirty Harry character. And I think that reflects, you know, in movies going forward into the future. So I thought, like, this movie was just so interesting. Uh, the moment where Harry Callahan's car turned into a motorbike uh, in the middle <laughs> of a car chase, I thought was a bit much, but I, I bought it. He was, he sold me on the film. No, I I think you're completely right. And yeah, a dark, the Dark Knight is actually a very good reference point because you, you think about Scorpio as a character. You say like as you said, you don't know anything about him. He's a complete cipher, basically. He gives you a, perhaps a tiny little bit of an idea of what he's trying to do at the beginning because he gives you who his targets are. But after that, it's basically a killing spree for no reason whatsoever. So you have... The only person you can say is, like, steadfast is Harry Callahan. He is your principal... You know, he's your lead man. And you can't really follow the plot of anyone else. You have to focus on him. And it is really all through his perspective as he takes this man down. It's very much like the opposite of The Day of the Jackal, where you're following the bad guy. This is you are following the good guy as he takes the bad guy down in a very effective way. And one thing I think that really stands out for me, and I mentioned it in the top bit of my review, was just the world building, that grime and grit of San Francisco. Like, there's bits where they're driving around basically in the dark, and you can't see anything, and he's like a peeping Tom through a window, trying to do some detective work. Like <laughs> At Hot Mary? At hot, yeah, at Hot <laughs> Mary. Uh, I wrote her name down. Uh, everyone was defending Hot Mary. She must just be uh, everyone's favorite. But... I can buy it. I can buy it. That's exactly what Sam Brown was like. And there were stand-up citizens or cops, I suppose, that like did their best and perhaps broke the law to enforce the law. And that is kind of... That vigilante thing, I don't know if it's necessarily a European thing. It seems to be very much like that one man against it all, which seems to be very like a North American stereotype you see quite a lot in film. Um, and it, and And also... You mentioned the westerns that came before this. This felt like a western 
just in a modern setting. Even some of the shots of him, like, with the magnum at his side, and he's, like, going to draw it, and they just do the shot of, like, the gun in the holster. Like, but his holster's on the side, I think. But anyway, like, he's going to draw it. Like, they they know how to build that tension. And going back to Eastwood, you mentioned uh, Five. I mentioned Five, and you mentioned Where Eagles Dare. And one of the cool things about Where Eagles Dare, the spy film we covered a couple of years ago now, is there was a lot more text for him, words for him to say on the script and he got rid of them all because he was like i'm much better when i'm just like going uh-huh yeah yeah mm-hmm. and that's exactly harry callahan's not telling you much about his life you find out his wife has died and he's you know doesn't really like buro- bureaucracy but barring that he's just as mad on a mission trying to take someone down and it's just effortlessly cool he doesn't seem to like anyone really because they had the point where, you know, does, uh, you know, when he gets a new partner, they're like, does does Harry, you know, dislike, you know, people of Latin descent? And they're like, oh, he dislikes everyone, every group, every whatever. I mean, there's a part in the movie that's interesting where he's like watching when they're doing surveillance and they see like some sort of like swingers party or something. There's like a nudist answering a door. And uh, you get this like look of just kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> with disgust on Harry's face. And this movie has a really interesting, I think, placement within American culture where it's like, this is after the Manson murders in 69. People are very wary of counterculture. And you have, you know, Scorpio wearing a peace sign belt. He has longer hair. It's very much this rigid man of the law against a crazed counterculture figure and this was a period where people were just genuinely scared about this sort of like you know people that could be taking over the streets as it were and you also look this is kind of falling into the uh the era of um dissatisfaction with the vietnam war um so of distrust in the government over things like that uh, watergate hasn't happened yet so things are going to get worse this feels like we're kind of at that early point of 70s pessimism uh right now it's like anger over still the, like kind of the hippie movement and things like that and that manson murder ripple effect but you really get the sense of this guy who's just not happy with the world he lives in and wants it to operate on his own code and there's an interesting element and i brought up the dark knight comparisons because that movie very much holds Batman up and says, like, is this guy on the level? Dirty Harry has this shtick he does when he has someone at gunpoint and they might potentially reach for a gun, where he recites this whole mantra, we all know it well, it's the do you feel lucky, well do you, punk, um, line. He does it twice in this movie. You know, at the start, when he breaks up a bank robbery, and at the end when he does it to Scorpio. It is very well rehearsed. And it leads me to really wonder how many times Dirty Harry has done this. Um, It feels like it's almost like this kind of routine he has to put himself through. Like, he has a line when he's talking about Scorpio about how he knows he's going to kill again. And they say, well, how do you know? And he goes, because he likes it. And I'm like, you tie that together with Dirty Harry and this weird bit of play acting he does, which usually, you know, ends with him pulling a trigger. It seems like there's a closer connection between these two men than perhaps Dirty Harry would like to admit. I could totally buy that. I think if you did like a deeper reading of the text, that's definitely there. I think for me, it's a maybe a bit more surface level in the fact that he's just representing the everyman, wanting to sort of bring justice to the world, never mind the consequences. And, that, that, and that's why things like the Batman really sort of appeal to people because they want to they see injustice around them they want to do something and and you know billionaire bruce wayne seems to be the embodiment of that even though none of us are billionaires um but so so i get why people i get why especially probably north america was very much behind this film uh, because it it feels like the sort of man who took the law into his own hands even though he is an inspector which is like quite a higher rank in the police so he's been doing it for a very long time and it would be followed a couple years later by Death, Witch, uh, Death Wish, which was like the Charles Bronson film, which there was a whole bunch of sequels as well. Like it really did kick off a whole vigilante hero craze. Now, one thing I want to talk about and maybe a slight detriment to the film is it kind of goes, I don't want to say it outstays its welcome. I don't know if you noticed this at all, but I really felt like it, it had finished when he's arrested Scorpio at the football stadium. 
right? I thought that was the end. And it and yeah, you know, that's actually like the end of the second act, or like if you do like a five act structure, maybe it's the end of the fourth. But yeah, it, it feels like it's wrapped up because they've caught the bad guy. But then obviously because Dirty Harry, there are consequences to his actions, much like they hold up the mirror to Batman. They do sort of hold Harry to task for you know breaking and entering, and then making all of the evidence they got completely invalid, which actually tracks in real life. That's actually quite cool. They brought that in. There was a consequence. I wonder if that consequence holds up in future films if he has to keep dealing with that sort of bureaucracy or or it just goes more towards just harry being a badass but i i i was surprised to find there was another 40 minutes left or, or 30 minutes after that point yeah i mean i know what you mean like the movie builds to like just the tension of that pursuit through the park mm-hmm. you know with that giant cross there in san francisco and then catching scorpio that you're like you kind of exhale and you're like okay but we got him yeah i i think like had the movie wrapped there and it would have been about an hour and 10 minute movie but nonetheless had it wrapped there i think it would be a really solid cop thriller i think that extra section elevates it when you have scorpio getting out and basically framing harry uh callahan in the press that section i really like and that's where like you get a lot of really cool uh, material of like Harry just following this guy from location to location. Um, the scene, I, uh, I'm, I'm mixed on the scene with the uh, the school bus. I, I believe the school bus um, hijacking was, this movie was heavily inspired by the Zodiac killings in San Francisco in uh, 68 and 69. And Zodiac was someone who taunted the police through the press. Um, they never really caught him i mean we don't to this day quite know who it was there's a lot of theories but uh it was something very much in pop culture at the time and so i think like zodiac had threatened i believe school buses in some of the letters to the police and so they wanted to kind of tighten that connection even though it's very overt right from the moment of the get-go where you've got him called scorpio um but uh i think they wanted that school bus sequence and i think it's very tense but it doesn't have sort of that dark intensity of the first half. Like when you've got like Andy Robinson leading sing-alongs and screaming at people on a school bus, you're kind of like, yes, he's scary, but we've gone kind of cuckoo. Like this villain exists on a plane of existence that is in no way representative of humanity. But you're right though, that second, it's not even a second half, it is probably the third act. Everyone kind of changes because Harry has to deal with consequence and you learn more about him in that portion he goes to visit chico in the hospital or or wherever like he does he actually does something to show an affection for someone else and then he tells chico's wife that his wife died you find out a little bit more about harry and i think that's also where scorpio kind of goes off off the edge as well because until this point he's, he's shot a few people but he's not really doing the sort of maniacal stuff whereas post that you've got him just killing a guy in a shop to get his gun speeding up an old man uh and then like shooting at kids in the school bus and like going he's going insane basically trying to kill a cop uh so you're right maybe that is that last section is what bumps it up to maybe mythic status because this film is very highly regarded even now um so i'm not saying unnecessary it's not necessarily a complaint it just felt like it was built up to that point so i assumed that was the ending um maybe that's how it's supposed to work well, it's such like a impact moment too, when they're like hauling her body out of the ground and everything, and you've got him like squeezing his foot down on the wound in Scorpio's leg. It feels the way like the music's crescendoing, like it could be the ending, and it would be like a hell of an ending in a different crime film. Well, because the objectives are complete. The good guy has stopped the bad guy. He's failed in his objective to save the girl, but he's stopped any more murders. But then the film takes the rug out and goes, well, actually, hang on. He cheated, and here's the consequence. And for me, that's probably the thing I like the most, is the fact that he has to deal with that consequence. He does overcome the odds still, but there is consequences to his actions. And I think that's maybe what is yeah bumping up high in other films. I think the reason that like certain critics... Um people like this movie like it's a, w- a very well regarded movie so i'm not mm-hmm. saying it's one that's you know heavily slammed but they've always been i think challenged by it um and trying to explain why they like it despite the fact it maybe doesn't 
quite meet uh, what they would like politically out of it. And yeah. I think it's because Dirty Harry, the movie sides with him at a certain point. And I think it is like when that uh, evidence can't be used in court and Scorpio is out, uh, ki- you know, kidnapping kids in a bus. Harry's like clearly the hero. Harry's the only one that can stop them because the, you know, the mayor and all the various police are either inept or just kind of like suck ups to, you know, just like brown nosers and things mm-hmm. like that. Like they, they are just a complete bunch of useless bureaucrats. And Harry's the only one that can actually stop this terror spree. So the movie is basically telling you this guy's a hero. And I think maybe that's why people are challenged by it. I don't have an issue when I watch the movie. It's very clearly this kind of moody character study of Harry Callahan. So you can kind of take what you'd like from the character. But I do think the movie kind of has a little bit of hero worship by the end where he's this lone figure standing on the bridge. I I agree, but I would say that you could really transport this story to any decade. And it would be the same thing. It's not necessarily political people that i know that you could see politics in this film maybe it is there but for me it really is just about someone taking the law into their own hands and this this could be long before you have a judicial system and this could be cavemen taking the law into their own hands it doesn't matter if they're not holding for 44 magnum um so I, I i'm not too sure why people have that sort of problem with it. it 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 clearly is a good film people who say it isn't i think uh, i i don't know probably reading too much into some sort of political political pull of this film uh i can understand i suppose what i will say is because he's he is an anti-hero and it's one thing i uh, i am always quite hesitant to get behind our anti-heroes like i don't like that recent joker film yeah like on the surface i like it but like people who actually get like tattoos of flacking phoenix in the joker outfit or like go dress up and go on those stairs in whatever town they shot that in like i have i have questions about those people i worry <laughs> about those people so people who dress up like Car- harry callahan with the 44 magnum and ask walking around saying do you feel lucky punk mm, i've got some problems with that but there's a moral core to the character that i think everyone can get behind because he's trying to do the right thing and that's what i like and i like that he's trying to do the right thing and there's obstacles to overcome like bureaucracy but he gets the bad guy in the end. It's actually very simple, like you said. And I like that, you know, when he has the new partner and, you know, people are saying, oh, he hates everyone. Harry's like smirking about it. Like you get the mm. sense that this guy's not the monster that everyone likes to acknowledge him as. Like there is, it, it's more a put upon kind of thing or a put on sort of um, yeah, yeah. affectation on his part to kind of give off this whole surly vibe. But he genuinely cares about that uh you know his partner chico when chico's like in the hospital and harry goes to visit like you can tell that he's actually like he actually cares about this individual and when chico's saying he's going to leave and go become a teacher harry's like yeah you're probably making the wise choice and then he says you know why are you, why do you still do it and he's like i don't know i don't know what else have i got well that's why i go back to this whole like harry is being kind of addicted to violence thing where it's like he doesn't know why he's still doing it and just i don't know like This is not the typical life of a police officer in this universe. Like most of the cops Harry's working with are not living the life he is and uh, having these altercations. And there's that scene where they talk about, you know, the business he had in Fillmore where he shot an attempted rapist. And he describes the incident of like a naked man with an erection and a butcher knife chasing a woman down an alley. And I'm like, that sounds like a very um, unrealistic uh <laughs> description of a scenario like that feels like something straight out of a very like crazy exploitation film not real life mm. and so it's like interesting how the movie is portraying that as like you should just accept this as is but i'm like was that really what happened no no but like that's this the, that's the point is harry is misleading his yeah. s- seniors like his senior officers he lies about how he gets the evidence and they find out i suppose that he assaulted scorpio and broke into the place probably from the other officer that was there so i imagine that was just harry's point of view that he told his colleagues and that's how he shot the guy whereas the reality might be that he just had a suspicion and and pulled his gun out that that's but then there's also a good reason i imagine why he is the man they reach to when they want to investigate scorpio you know he's clearly the first in every day and the last one out working overtime and they even said like you should claim the overtime he says no nah, don't worry about it 
Like he he comes to work because he wants to serve justice. And it also feels like his superiors don't approve of him, but at the same time are kind of willing to look the other way if it means that these things get resolved. Like I, you know, this movie ends famously with Harry throwing his badge away, only to be followed by four sequels. Um, but I was uh, wondering about that. Like, does it does it jump back out of the water in the next one and he catches it? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, he's back on the force. A fish like kicks it back. <laughs> this flipper, and he's like, oh, the law needs you. Me. Forgot this, Harry. <laughs> oh, gee, <laughs> take your star. <laughs> what was that voice? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, I'm a fish. Saddle up, partner. <laughs> blub blub blub. <laughs> so, like, the movie. I think. Do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> well. <laughs> Do ya? <laughs> oh boy. But like Dirty Harry, there's like multiple sequels, right? And it's like this movie, when I finished it, was like this had it just ended there and there's no franchise. Mm. Like that is a really strong ending about the journey of Harry where he like realizes at the end that he can't do this anymore. Like he just. There isn't justice anymore. Yeah, exactly. Um, it ha- it's, I think, a much more pessimistic, darker ending than uh, a franchise would allow. Than then the fish appearing and, and saving the day. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Unless you're Planet of the Apes, in which case you try to top how depressing your ending is every time. But, like, they would go into, you know, four more Dirty Harry movies where it's, like, you know, cases that Harry has to take on. There's always, like, a personal conflict with him through in the stories. But it's not this, like... I need to leave the force, the force is breaking me, that sort of stuff kind of more or less fades away. Would you say, I'm not saying we're going to tackle the sequels on here, I'm not sure we will, but do they, is it like diminishing returns with the sequels? Do they get less interesting as it goes? Or is it more about the world gets more interesting and Harry gets less interesting? I think every sequel finds an interesting angle on the character. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like it's um, just recycled stories over and over again. Um, I guess we could leave it just to the patrons. If they would like to hear coverage of the full Dirty Harry series, a series let us know. Uh, send us a message on the Patreon. Um, because, hey, we're doing Star Wars. It's not out of the realm of possibility. But um, it's, I think, like, when you look at, say, the Lethal Weapons, there's a little bit of sameness as they keep going. Whereas I would say the Dirty Harrys, each of the movies very much stands on its own. Um, they all have an interesting angle. I would say that of the five, four of, of yeah, of the five, four of them are, you know, good to, to grade. Okay. Maybe maybe we'll you can let us know, guys. But like I mean, overall, just my thoughts then I suppose I I, I genuinely enjoyed it. I, I of one, of all the films, it kind of reminded me of like Cool Hand Luke, not in terms of the actual film itself, but like of my reaction to ones we've tackled on Agents in the Field, where I was just drawn into the film. Top-notch performances from everyone, from Clint Eastwood barely saying a word and being super cool, like eating a hot dog whilst serving justice with his forty-four Magnum. That's I, People didn't like guns and things like that. I don't like guns, but that was cool. It looked cool, and you can't avoid that. What did you think of Andrew Robinson? Just uh, plain, simple Scorpio. <laughs> uh, I was... I didn't know it was him at first. I didn't quite recognize him. I to, and then it kind of clicked in my head because obviously I'm used to Andy Robinson being under all that prosthetics. But after years of seeing him at conventions, I'm familiar with his face. Um, I actually really dug his kind of cr- lunatic, unhinged performance. I thought it was quite memorable. Um, I, I, I was watching it with Hannah, actually, for most of it. And we both kind of like giggled when he was, he'd been stabbed in the leg. And he really lent into that like limp running yeah, he for the rest of the film he had a limp. I was like, fair play. By the end, he was probably like uh, with a sore hip. And like that sound he makes when Harry stabs him in the leg is like so animalistic. Like that could kind of describe the whole performance. It's very like animalistic throughout. It's just crazed. And I think if you were to make this movie now, they would be acknowledging this character is perhaps schizophrenic. They would have more of a uh, attempt to psychoanalyze who he is. Um, I like that the movie does it. It makes it this more kind of primal hunt film yeah. between him and Harry. Um, and I mean, there's some incredibly tense moments of him on those rooftops. 
when he is like lining up the shots right off the top set to that like jazzy kind of score that sequence is incredibly tense and then there's the one later where he's going to shoot uh the gay man in the park Mm -hmm. and he can't get the shot and he's moving around and like just unbelievably tense filmmaking from don siegel there and the way it's edited and scored and then when you have that you know the helicopter coming in and it turns into like this chase just unbelievable stuff and i think this movie makes it, it's so stripped down in so many ways but i think it makes all of these like moments even when it's just harry and his partner as you said you know driving around san francisco at night looking for scorpio it makes those sequences so tense and even just Harry running all over the city with a you know suitcase full of money, trying to basically pass off the bag to get the hostage freed, all that stuff really does hold up. Well, I'm going to ask you about that because it was one of my notes. That felt very like Die Hard three. Yeah, that chase. That that's got. I mean, I'm sure that chase is from something else anyway. But that that had to have been a nod back to Dirty Harry, surely. I think most American cop thrillers post 1970s uh we're definitely calling back to harry uh in some way or another i thought you were gonna say harry palmer I was like, hmm. no. <laughs> well that's obvious that's well, all movies all movies look back to harry palmer this film actually does have a lot of strange camera angles to it speaking of the ipcrits file it does like whoever was a cinematographer on this was, was trying to do something a bit different like that, that shot where they're standing under the cross in the park in san francisco like they're lo- looking up at harry as he's standing in front of the cross like it's like a very striking image I, I know i get annoyed by like people taking shots behind phone boxes but still it's very stylish like if you were to make this movie now they probably wouldn't invest that level of artistry in the cinematography it, it would look like the gray man yeah exactly exactly like uh the cinematographer was bruce surtees who worked on movies like beverly hills cop Escape from Alcatraz, another Eastwood movie, um, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, which is very underrated. So he was definitely like a very capable dude. And I think like this movie really just looks fantastic. And it's the sort of thing I definitely did not appreciate when I saw it back in the day. Mm. But watching it, you know, a couple years ago and then last night, I'm like, damn, this movie looks good. And I remember at the time when I first saw it, I didn't have that much of an appreciation for movies where it was like this very like kind of sleazy 70s look. It was the sort of thing where I was like, this is a weird look and I do not dig it, man. And now I love it. I watch like Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3 and films like that. And I'm like, give me more movies set in this gritty kind of grungy universe. You, you've seen what the world looks like now and you're like, nope, take me back to the 70s. I don't want to be here anymore. Give me some tan and bl- like plaid and all that sort of thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. take me back. Absolutely. Um, I did have a question for you uh, just before we leave the Andy Robinson topic behind. Yeah. Because we're talking about Batman. Uh, I mentioned the Batman. And you know, you've got... Um, who's the bad guy in that? The Riddler? The Riddler. Paul Dano? Yeah, Paul Dano. Um, so he is a, a kooky guy. And then you find out more about him and you uncover the story through like they raid his apartment. You find out like what his motives are. And he's like an incel that kind of thing. Whereas this, you don't know anything about Andy Robinson. Really, in, uh, at all. You don't find anything out. There, There is no like clues they really find out on the way. You get that little letter from him at the start. That's about it. Do you, Is that enough for you? Are you happy with that delivery? Like, did, did you want a little bit more? Or is that? do you think that's just more films these days have conditioned us to want to have a story for your antagonist? I think that's more modern filmmaking where everything has to be sometimes over explained. Um, I, I do think though that as movies, you know, continue through the decades and we have a better sense of mental health, we feel more um, a need to try to understand just the psychology of villains. And that's not something in 1971, they would have been overly concerned with. It would have been more like, well, he's insane. He's an insane killer. And what more could you possibly say? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think I needed any more. I was reading some reviews myself, and people were lamenting the lack of depth to the Scorpio killer, uh, and I was I was fine with him just being a force that needed to be stopped. Really, it, it didn't need any more explanation. This film is very light on words, right? Like, there's a lot of just visuals in the film, like the driving around San Francisco, the chasing, the running, the shooting. And I, I was quite happy with that, despite having, you know, a reasonably long runtime, I think a sub two hours. But um, yeah, it didn't bore quite me. Quite a bit, yeah, quite a bit shorter. It's I think an hour forty basically, 
And I mean, I think the thing with Scorpio is he is a presence. Like that's what this movie needs him for. It doesn't care. He's larger than life. Yes, he's definitely larger than life. Um, he's almost like it's almost comedic how this is like someone like Harry's worst nightmare come true, and he's basically there to allow us into the kind of the mindset of Dirty Harry, not mm-hmm. so much to give us like when you watch the movie Heat, you understand De Niro and Pacino very very well. Uh, I don't know that this movie cares as much if you are uh, you know empathizing with Scorpio. I I was curious. I had a question for you though. We visited um, San Francisco, period era San Francisco, not so long ago with Dr. Goldfoot. Mm. And that would have been what, like, um, not... 66, I think it was a 67. So like five years, four years before this movie. And just the depiction of San Francisco between the two was so interesting to me, where like San Francisco is a really beautiful city. And this movie is going out of its way to not show you the beautiful locations. A lot of it's very, like, grimy looking. A lot of, like, you know, porn theaters and, uh, like, strip clubs and just, like, these kind of, you know, kind of urban decay environments. Um, Even, like, when they're in that park. It's not the most picturesque park you've ever seen before. It's kind of ugly. Yeah, there's, like, beer cans on the floor. There's trash everywhere. Like, yeah, it's, it's grungy. It's grimy. Yeah, it's just interesting how that difference between, like, what 1960s film likes to do versus like the 1970s, which was much, just a much more pessimistic time in filmmaking. But look, I'm just thinking of the two comparisons in my head. It's like the two versions of Hill Valley and Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. Um, I think well, one was the 80s, though, wasn't it? Not the not the 70s. That was with the porn theaters. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Did they go back to the 70s at all? No, it was 65, 85, and 1885. It's interesting to me that, like, this one is set in San Francisco because that's not, like, the city I would have thought of. Like, it feels almost in some ways like a New York movie, and that's what the 70s was so famous for was these gritty New York films. But that's nice. Maybe that just gives it a different vibe. Like, it it looks Mm -hmm. a bit different. And plus, I don't know, maybe someone lived there and they just wanted to use some of the places. Like, that cross is, yeah, a big, powerful shot. I don't know if that's actually there in San Francisco. You've been there. Is that an actual place? I have that cross. I am completely unaware of. It looks so like, huge. If it, yeah, if it's there, I would like to go see it because that is a very iconic location in a movie. Yeah, it feels like the amount, the size of it. It, it should have been there. Maybe it was, and they've taken it down. I'll have a look. Um, but yeah, any, any final notes before we try and turn it into a spy film? I don't think so. It's much more straightforward than a lot of the movies we cover, I think, mm. on this show. Yeah. Um, it's one I think holds up fantastically well. And if you haven't seen Dirty Harry and you're only really aware of, like, you know, the memes or the just the pop culture, you know, the snippets of dialogue that have made their way into the zeitgeist over the years, um, over the decades, I should say, um, check out Dirty Harry. I think it's a lot more interesting than you might think. And it doesn't kind of fall into that kind of junky cop thriller, uh, you know, disposable franchise movie that you might think it would. No, and it's also not like a particularly wanky cinematic, you know, uh, you know I'm not going to slag off David Lynch, but some of his films are a bit long and and weird. Um, you know, one of those like uh, auto directors and everyone has to love it because it was made by this person. It's just a very, very good film. Like it, as mm-hmm. I'm sure general audiences all loved it. I wouldn't be surprised oh, at yeah. the time. Oh, yeah. It's Phenomenon. four sequels. So, yeah, it makes complete sense. So, yeah, I, I would definitely say go out of your way to watch it. If if we haven't convinced you already, then allow my words to say so. Go, go and check it out. And uh, I can't vouch for the sequels, though, at this point. Um, I was trying to work in a joke about, like, Poppy and peeing into the chair, but uh, this film's too good for that. Yeah, that's true. So I guess we have a question we have to ask. How do we turn this movie into a spy movie? Hmm... So the trouble is, do you make Harry a spy or do you make Scorpio a spy? I think we've gone this uh, route before, but I think you have to make Scorpio like a rogue asset. Mm. Well, I was thinking more like Day of the Jackal, where he, he's an assassin. He's trying to get to his target. And then like yeah. you've got the cop trying to take him down. But we allowed Day of the Jackal as a spy film. So I, I could still make Scorpio a spy in this, I think. I think so, and he's someone who I think, like, are we making all of his targets actual, like, mission targets, or is he someone who's just, like, skipped the tracks, basically? No, I don't think he's gone rogue. I think he is just, 
He's a, he's a asset for hire at this point. Like many spies, they just wander between um, worlds and, and different organizations and different countries, uh, and they're just you know guns for hire. I think that's pretty much what he is. What was the target going on when he was hijacking the school bus? <laughs> what mission was, like a, was that? Was like a child of a senator, maybe, or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I won't joke about that too much, but yeah, I, I, I that would be my spin on it, though. I, I'd be like, Harry is is law enforcement, which he is. That still fits the bill. But the Scorpio is your is your spy, so it's the day of the Scorpio, and he is. Maybe he's gone undercover as a hippie. It's like deep cover, and that's why he's living in the in the stadium. If you if you hate this pitch, by all means, throw me another one. You know who I think Scorpio might align well with in terms of movies we've covered on the show. Bob I'm Hope. Thinking of Bob Hope. You nailed it. Nailed it. We can call him Peanuts from now on. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> um, I think of Stellan Skarsgård in Ronin, mm. where he has like, yeah, you know, he's obviously like an agent who's been hired. But like, there's that scene where he's sitting there, like pointing the uh, the gun at like the kid on the playground. Mm. That is Scorpio. That lines up pretty well. So I think if we have him as someone who is a working operative but is clearly unhinged and dangerous. It helps explain him a little more because Stellan Skarsgård, while a complete lunatic in Ronin, has a focused mission throughout that you know story. Yeah, and he is definitely a loose cannon, much like our Scorpio is. So, I guess, I guess he has gone rogue from his original organization, and he's now a gun for hire. And the organization has sent Agent Callahan out to bring him back into the fold or bring him down. And I don't think it's like insane to have a lead. You know, protagonist spy who's fed up with the uh, the institution with which he works. I think that's a pretty common trope in spy movies. We, we've seen it a million times, and we've only done a hundred films, so <laughs> that's right. It just goes to show. Yeah, I mean, even in Bond films, like he he resigns his 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 commission in MI6 at least five or six times. Yeah, I mean, you've got Lazenby getting fed up in Honor Majesties, and then you get to the Craig era where it's an even tenser relationship between them. I mean, License even in the kill, last he film. Hands it in. License to Kill. Um, but I think of even No Time to Die, where he's finding out what, you know, Ray Fiennes' M is up to and is completely, like, fed up with the organization. Hmm, absolutely. Well, that's our pitch for Dirty Harry uh, as a spy film. Would we still call it Dirty Harry? Oh, uh, boy. I'm... Um... Or is it or is it Day of the Scorpio? Day of the Scorpio? That's pretty good actually. Um Dirty Harry is such a weird title for like a spy film. Yeah, I don't I don't know that that works. I I, I it's a weird title for any film really. I I think I I don't know what like <laughs> Because back in those days you didn't really have tra- uh, you did have trailers, but you, you wouldn't necessarily see them on TV as much. Right. Um so like if you just saw like a paper listing Dirty Harry showing you your local Cineplex. You'd be like, what? Is he a window cleaner? I mean, I'm sure that they were just throwing up enormous banners of Clint Eastwood's face everywhere with sure. Dirty Harry. I can imagine that. Him and the and the 44 Magnum. That's, uh, that's going to sell tickets. That'll put butts in seats. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Um, well, yeah, that was our chat about Dirty Harry. We both sincerely recommend you check it out if you haven't already. Um... As always, we want to thank you all for supporting us here on Patreon. Uh, We're getting ever closer to our goal of upgrading our microphones so we won't sound like this anymore. Actually, that's a lie. We will still sound like this. I'll just sound more nasally because my microphone will be better. Looking forward to it. (laughs) As I'm sure you all are too. (laughs) Um, But Cam, what are we talking about next time on Agents in the Field? Yeah, we are going to wrap up our Star Wars prequel coverage with our review of Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Here we go, people. Let's see if uh, <laughs> let's see if the uh, the final chapter delivers a little better than the first two on the revisit. Um, I was quite up on Phantom Menace, but I was definitely low on Attack of the Clones. So uh, hopefully, yeah. hopefully Revenge of the Sith bumps it up a little bit. But I'm not looking forward to watching them younglings get taken out. That still makes me sad. Master Skywalker, what are we going to do about There's too many of them. <laughs> How is it we did like uh, two movies, 
Dirty Harry and uh, Star Wars for this round. And they both feature like children in danger. And Star Wars is the most violent one in terms of the kid violence. Yeah, that's crazy. And even like uh, him being set on fire at the end, like bur- his yeah. flesh burning. Yeah. They both, and I wouldn't be surprised if Dirty Harry had a higher rating in like the whatever the rating system is. Oh, yeah. It was a hard R. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy when you think about it. Hmm. Well, there you go, folks. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to join us next time on Agents in the Field as we check out Star Wars Episode 3, The Revenge of the Sith. But until next week, listeners, I know what you're thinking. Did we record six podcasts or five? Well, to tell you the truth in all this excitement, I kind of lost track myself. But being that this is Spy Hard's podcast, the most powerful podcast in the world, and it would blow your ears clean off, you do have got to ask yourself one question. Do you feel lucky? Well, do you?